Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, or if this is your first time here, welcome. Today we are going to be covering the case of Megan Meyer. This case, like the majority of the ones covered on this channel, came in as a request, and I have to say it is one of the most harrowing, nonsensical cases I've had to cover. Before we begin, if there is a case you would like to see me cover, let me know either by leaving a comment down below or emailing me at dreading.official at gmail.com. I also want to say thank you for all the recent support as this channel has reached over 400,000 subscribers in under a year. I appreciate all the kind words, criticisms, and help that all of you have so graciously provided me, and I hope to do better in the coming months. With all that said, let us begin. Megan Taylor Meyer was born November 6, 1992, to parents Christina and Ronald Meyer in O'Fallon, Missouri. Growing up, Megan always felt like something was wrong with her, and as if she wasn't quite like those around her. She struggled with learning and paying attention, and was often made to feel like she was too much. Teachers would say she was inattentive, wild, and loud, and her peers would often bully her, saying she was crazy, dramatic, and weird. In class, she felt like everyone had a much easier time and could process things quickly, but she had struggled with some of the most basic subjects. If the subject didn't interest her, she would find her attention drifting off to something more exciting, and when something piqued her interest, she was obsessive. Beyond her difficulty with learning, she struggled to make friends. Megan was a bubbly, goofy girl who loved to make people smile, and would often work extremely hard to get a laugh. She was always willing to take things further than those around her, making jokes at her own expense just to try and fit in. But it seemed to do the opposite. Instead of finding acceptance, Megan was often made to feel as if she were wildly different from those around her. Megan became the target of bullying in her school, and was picked on for everything, from the way she talked to her weight, and the more she tried to fit in, the more she felt like she didn't. And by the time she was in third grade, when she was just 11 years old, she had already begun to consider taking her own life. Thankfully, she told her mom, who immediately sought out to get her daughter help. After speaking with a psychiatrist, Megan was diagnosed with attention deficit disorder and depression, stemming from deeply rooted self-esteem issues. Having a name and diagnosis seemed to help Megan and her family for a short while, as they could put into practice some of the advice that her psychiatrist would recommend. But still, the bullying at school didn't stop. Megan did have one friend, though, a girl who lived on her block, who was also in her class, Sarah Drew. Sarah, like Megan, was often ridiculed and bullied, and the girls leaned on each other for support. But as is the case in most middle school friendships, they would often fight, stop speaking, then make up as if nothing happened. Their families were friends, having met when Christina sold the Drews their home, and the girls were often at each other's houses. They spent holidays and vacations together, and when they weren't fighting, they were inseparable. The summer before the start of middle school, Megan told her mom and Sarah that she was excited for school to start. She had hoped that the new year would bring her a new chance to make friends and be seen as more than just the weird girl who everyone made fun of. She felt as if she had matured and had her sights set on befriending the popular girls at school. However, the opposite would happen. The girls who Megan had been so keen on befriending would turn on her in the first weeks of school. And once again, Megan was the target for bullying. This time, the girls in her class focused mainly on her weight, telling Megan that she was fat and unsightly. Every time she ate at school, girls in her class would make cow noises at her and comment cruelly, and she quickly stopped eating during the day. The bullying got so bad that Megan eventually broke down and begged her parents not to take her to class. Every day she would cry when she got ready, asking them repeatedly to let her stay home, and when they picked her up, it was the same. Christina and Ron believed that eventually things would turn around for Megan, but things continued to get worse. After a few more weeks of torment, Megan told her parents that she couldn't go back to school and that they needed to either homeschool her or transfer her to a new school, which they eventually did. This change proved to be beneficial for Megan, as she was able to make new friends and integrate into her new school without issue. In just three months at the new school, Megan was able to make new friends, join volleyball, and seemed to be feeling better than she had in years. Only one thing seemed to be an issue, and that was the fact that she had grown apart from Sarah Drew. Christina told her daughter that that kind of change was normal. People sometimes grow apart then back together, and she was sure that whatever had happened between the two girls would right itself in time, but unfortunately, that was not the case. 
While Megan was starting to make friends at her new school, the social media site MySpace was quickly gaining popularity amongst teens and young adults. Overnight, it seemed as if everyone her age and older had a MySpace, and daily, kids would come home from school having spent their nights on the site. The kids who didn't have a MySpace, whether that be because they didn't have their own computer or their parents didn't allow them to, were left scrambling, trying to figure out what their friends were talking about and what they had missed. Though the MySpace terms of service stated that kids under the age of 14 were not allowed on the site, Megan and other girls her age had made profiles on the website in an attempt to talk to boys their age. In order to avoid being banned, they would often use pictures of older girls on their profiles, but it was clear that the accounts were run by young teens. Before their falling out, Megan and Sarah had created a joint MySpace together, and to circumvent any ban, they made the profile picture the Playboy Bunny logo. Christina eventually found out about the account and shut it down. She sat her daughters down and talked to her about the dangers of being online. But Megan, like most teens, didn't care all that much. She just wanted to be included, and that meant getting on MySpace. When Megan started 8th grade, she approached her mom in an attempt to use the social media platform. She told her that she was almost 14 years old, and as such, she should be allowed to make an account on the site. She promised Christina that she would be careful, and told her mom that she could monitor all her messages and posts to make sure she didn't do anything bad, and she would have final say over who she could be friends with on the site. After discussing it further, Christina eventually relented and allowed Megan to make her own account. Within a day of setting up her account, Megan received a friend request from a stranger. The account seemed to be a boy her age named Josh Evans, and according to his profile, he was going to be moving into the O'Fallon area soon and was looking to make new friends. The friend request also came with a message telling her that she was pretty, and Megan swooned. Because of the intense bullying she had undergone throughout middle school, Megan had never received any positive attention romantically, and having a cute guy her age flirt with her made her feel special. She begged her mom to allow her to accept the friend request, and after seeing that the account was run by someone in the area that was her daughter's age, she relented, but not before calling the local police department and asking if there was a way to verify that this Josh Evans profile was real or not. Megan and Josh started talking and he seemed to be the perfect guy. They had similar interests and he seemed to like everything she did. And he told her she was the most beautiful girl he had ever seen. Megan felt as if she was on cloud nine. She began telling everyone around her about Josh, how kind and considerate he was, and every day she would rush home to get online hoping to talk to him. But there were a few red flags, ones that would only become apparent later. Megan had fallen head over heels for Josh, and would often ask him if they could talk on the phone, but he would refuse, saying that neither he or his mom had a cell phone or a landline. This was exceedingly uncommon, given that most people needed to have at least a landline to be able to go online. But, according to both Christina and Ron, their daughter was the happiest she had ever been. She was constantly smiling and talking about her online crush, and she was making more positive changes in her life because of it. She was more outgoing, no longer caring about the judgment of others around her, because she felt as if Josh liked her the way she was. By October 2006, Megan was ecstatic. Her online relationship was going well, her birthday was right around the corner, and she felt as if, for the first time in her life, everything was going great. Her parents had planned an elaborate 14th birthday party, including a grand entrance where she would be carried in by her father, and for the first time in her young life, she felt comfortable inviting her friends from school. However, on October 16th, everything changed. Out of nowhere, Josh's messages changed tone. He told her, I don't know if I want to be friends with you anymore because I've heard you're not very nice to your friends. This, of course, shocked Megan. She had no idea where this was coming from, especially given their past conversations, and she desperately asked Josh what he was talking about. She frantically messaged him, asking for some form of clarification, but seemingly got nothing in response. The next day, Megan couldn't get her mind off of what had happened on MySpace. She was down on herself, wondering what had changed Josh's mind about her, and hoping that he messaged her, she attempted to get on MySpace at school to see if he responded, but was forced to wait until she got home to check. And to her shock and horror, Josh had not only responded to her, but he had publicly posted some of their private messages. These messages had been Megan at her most vulnerable, and some had gotten sexual in nature. 
messages where Megan had talked about her friends to Josh, vented to him about her life, and more were shared via bulletins, and some had polls attached to them. People began posting their own bulletins about the situation, talking about what they thought about Megan, which was notably all negative. The 13-year-old had no idea what to do. Her life had been so blissful mere days beforehand and she felt as if everything was going so well, and now she felt alone and violated. Her most intimate moments were being ridiculed by her friends and classmates, and she called her mother hysterical. Christina, not understanding the situation entirely, told her daughter to sign off, believing that whatever was happening couldn't be that bad, but Megan couldn't. She felt as if she needed to defend herself, or at the very least, find out why Josh was doing this. He had been her best friend just days before, and she had no idea what she had done wrong. After her orthodontist appointment, Christina called her daughter to see if she had signed off, only to learn that Megan was even more upset, having gotten more messages from her peers. When her mother returned home, she scolded her daughter, but for not listening to her when she said to sign off. It was a whirlwind. It was Josh saying horrible things to Megan, Megan saying things back to him. Nasty messages from a boy who just a day before meant everything to this lonely girl. One in particular cut deep. The world would be a better off place without you and have a shitty rest of your life. Megan was distraught beyond words. This is the part I'll never forgive myself for because she um, she was looking for me to help um, calm her down like I normally always did and be there for her. And I was upset with her because I didn't like the language that she was using. And um, I was upset that she didn't listen to me and sign off when I told her to. And um, so... I was aggravated with her about that and told her that she knew better and um, she just said to me, you're supposed to be my mom, you're supposed to be on my side and she took off running upstairs. And for some of the language she had used in the messages themselves. After screaming at her mother, Megan ran upstairs and it was there where she hung herself from her closet using a belt. Her parents believed she was cooling off after the argument and that when they got her for dinner that night, she would be calm enough to talk about what had happened that day. But 20 minutes later, Christina would find her daughter. Tina left, walked upstairs. I didn't really pay much attention to it. Um, and then I just heard a blood curdling scream. I just saw her hanging from her closet. When she just screamed, I, I was right to, there. Um, I tried picking her up. I, uh... held her and I yanked the whole closet thing out of the wall and Tina ran and got a knife so I could cut the uh, belt from around her neck and then started performing CPR. She had tears the entire time running down the side of her face the entire until she passed away. <laughs> Just it's like please please Megan breathe Megan was pronounced dead the next day. As is often the case, the community that had been so malicious and scornful towards the 13-year-old was shaken by her death and immediately began to send their sympathy towards the family. People who had teased Megan and even people who had posted nasty messages about her the day of her death were making posts, saying that they had no idea she'd been picked on so terribly. Okay, now we get it. Now we're all really, really sorry. Okay. Yeah, no harm, no foul. That makes sense. The Myers family was broken and sought to try and find answers about what had happened. But upon logging into their daughter's MySpace page, they found that the man who had seemingly started the attacks, Josh, no longer seemed to exist. His MySpace, mere hours after Megan's suicide, had been deleted. When Ron Meyer came home from the hospital, he wanted to find Josh Evans, let him know what he had done to his little girl. The first place he tried to look was Josh's MySpace page. It was uh, deleted. The whole Josh Evans no longer existed. However, they were able to see her last messages with Josh via AOL Instant Messenger, and it became clear why she had felt the need to take her own life. The boy who had lifted her spirits had told her, Everybody in O'Fallon knows how you are. You are a bad person and everybody hates you. The world would be a better place without you. In response, Megan simply replied, You are the kind of boy a girl would kill herself over. 
it became clear that whatever had happened, Josh Evans had played some part in it. Christina and Ron showed the police the messages and gave them everything they had on the young boy, explaining the relationship between him and their daughter. However, the police quickly noted that online bullying and simply telling someone that they should die didn't constitute a crime. But that wasn't the only issue with the case, as they were quick to discover that Josh Evans didn't really exist. The profile itself led to a dead end, and the investigation seemed to be at a standstill while the police tried to contact MySpace. That is, until six weeks after Megan's funeral, when a single mother contacted the Myers family and told them they had information about Josh. While the family didn't know this person directly, they were a close neighbor, and someone who agreed to their measures of talking at their grief counselor's office. It was then that they were informed that their suspicions had been correct. Josh Evans wasn't a real person, but a fake profile that was made with the direct intention to mess with their daughter. And worse still, it was created by Lori Drew, mother of Sarah Drew and friend of the family. In the time since Megan's death, the Drews had provided comfort and kindness to the Meyer family, and had even gone so far to attend the funeral. The mother who had contacted the Myers told the grieving parents that prior to Megan's suicide, she had bragged to her and her daughter about the scheme, saying that they were doing it to mess with Megan. But the day Megan died, she received a phone call from Lori, telling her to keep her mouth shut about the page. A similar thing had happened with Christina Chu, a local hairdresser, who would later come forward to the Myers and tell them that prior to Megan's death, Lori had told her about the fake MySpace and how she was bullying a young girl online. After Megan had died and prior to the funeral, Lori had come back in for a hair appointment, and Chu asked her why she would go to the funeral of the girl she basically killed. According to Chu, Drew stated, It's not like I pulled the trigger. Christina and Ron were obviously shocked and appalled. They had assumed that what had occurred to their daughter had been the work of teen girls who didn't know any better. But hearing the event was entirely orchestrated by someone over the age of 40, someone who knew about Megan's past issues with bullying and thought it would be funny to attack her and rage them, especially since after the funeral, the Drews had asked them to hide some of their kids' Christmas presents in their garage. The people who bullied their daughter into taking her own life asked them for a favor, and they had done so without question. After the meeting, the Myers went back to their home and destroyed the gifts they had been storing for the Drew family. They then carried the carnage over to the home, just four doors down, and left it on their driveway, spray-painting Merry Christmas on the box, carrying the remains. Upon seeing what the Myers had done, Lori and her husband realized that the Myers now knew that they knew, at least partially, about what had happened, and that they should probably try to make amends. They claimed they wanted to explain themselves and tell the Myers everything, which is entirely irrational. How they expected to talk through the fact that they had maliciously bullied a 13-year-old that they knew was depressed and dealt with suicidal ideation to the point of killing themselves, I don't know. But according to their own admission, that's what they attempted to do. They walked over to the home and banged on the door, telling Ron and Christina to come outside to talk to them. The pair taunted the family, saying to come out and speak to them like adults, but they remained inside, with Ron informing them if they didn't get off their property, he would force them off. He had his friends explain to the Drews that they didn't care about what they had to say. There was no reasonable explanation for making a fake account to bully their daughter into taking her own life. Despite this, both Lori and her husband did this countless times, seemingly mocking the family for not wanting to speak to the people who harassed and exploited their deceased daughter. Following the Myers finding out about Lori's involvement in their daughter's death, it seemed that the entire community of O'Fallon had heard about what had happened and sided with the Myers. Tensions grew in the community, as most people found what Lori had done to be disgusting, and she, for one, felt as if she was being unfairly victimized. On November 25th, a bit over a month since Megan's passing, Lori called the police and filed the following police report. Lori Drew wished to inform law enforcement about neighborhood dispute. According to Drew, she felt she needed to confront the neighbors, identified as Ronald Meyer and Christina Meyer, in reference to their daughter's suicide. Drew explained she wanted to tell them what she did to contribute to the Meyer's daughter's suicide. Drew stated in the months leading up to Meyer's daughter's suicide, she instigated and monitored a MySpace account, which was created for the sole purpose of communicating with the Meyer's daughter. Drew said she, with the help of a temporary employee named Ashley, more on her in a bit, constructed a profile of good-looking male on MySpace in order to find out what Megan was saying online about her daughter. 
Drew explained the communication between the fake male profile and Megan was aimed at gaining Megan's confidence and finding out what Megan felt about her daughter and other people. Drew stated she, her daughter and Ashley all typed, read, and monitored the communication between the fake male profile and Megan. Drew went on to say the communication became sexual for a 13-year-old. Drew stated she continued the fake male profile despite this development. Consequently, this would make her, an adult woman, guilty of sexually exploiting a minor online. In this case, that thread is often not touched upon but I felt it important to note. According to Drew, somehow, other MySpace users were able to access the fake male profile and Megan found out she was being duped. Drew stated she knew arguments had broken up between Megan and other users on MySpace. Drew felt this incident contributed to Megan's suicide, but she didn't feel as guilty because at the funeral, she found out Megan had tried to commit suicide before. Lori is obviously trying to defer any guilt and responsibility on her, her employee, or her daughter's part here, stating that somehow hackers were able to access the fake account and they were the ones to send the final cruel messages to Megan. She had already admitted to the bulk of the harassment and claimed to have made the account with the idea of bullying Megan, but apparently admitting that she had caused the child's death was a bridge too far. Drew explained the neighborhood had recently found out about her involvement in Megan's suicide, and her neighbors had become hostile towards her and her family. Despite the recency of the suicide and several neighbors in recommending she not confront the Meyer family, especially on Thanksgiving, Drew stated she and her husband attempted to contact the Meyer family three times, banging on the door, although Mr. Meyer had already told them to leave. Drew wished the current tension in the neighborhood be documented, in case any of her property is damaged. Further, Drew insisted on contacting the Meyer family to inform them of what she knows. Drew stated she just needed to tell them to relieve herself of any responsibility and apparent guilt. As if that wasn't enough, five days after filing the police report, the Drews sent the following letter to the Myers, Ron and Tina. We are very sorry for the extreme pain you are going through and can only imagine how difficult it must be. We have every compassion for you and your family. It is apparent from recent happenings in the neighborhood that you have been given information that causes you and now others to believe that we bear heavy responsibility for Megan's death. Though we have wanted to talk to you about the information we know, no time yet seemed appropriate. Things have now taken a turn that suggests whatever information is being discussed surely goes beyond what we know. You have made it clear that you do not want to talk to us, at least not at this time. We believe it's important that you give us the opportunity to talk with you as soon as you can bring yourself to do so. Our interest is to make you fully aware of the facts that we are aware of. Sincerely, Lori and Kurt. Neither Ron nor Tina responded to the letter, wanting to have nothing to do with the people who gleefully tormented their daughter for fun. The police report did nothing other than show people how incredibly out of touch Lori was, as she felt she was somehow the victim in all of this. However, it would later have another unintended consequence. In the small town of O'Fallon, people were well aware of what Lori had done, and they were making their feelings known. Lori was being shunned by the community, who reportedly already hadn't liked her, and her business began to suffer as a result. A few weeks after filing the initial report, Lori called the cops again, this time to report a brick had been thrown through their kitchen window early in the morning. The police report states, Miss Drew stated she did not see who committed the crime. However, she admitted there has been ongoing harassment with several neighbors due to another incident in which they blame her for the death of a redacted subject. A month after, she called the police again, stating that the Myers were harassing her family and causing them a great deal of grief and distress, which is incredibly ironic given that she killed their daughter. She claimed on January 21st, 2007, that Ronald Meyer had driven by their house that morning, while her family was outside shoveling the driveway and yelled, Who are you going to kill today? According to the police report, she claimed that because of the harassment and tension in the community, her daughter was being ostracized, and it was no longer safe for her to walk to school or play outside. She told the police dispatcher she would be installing security cameras around her home, just in case, and that she was hoping to avoid taking this issue to court. Three months later, Drew called the police again, this time saying a paintball had been shot at her home, which she believed was done by the Myers. Despite installing security cameras, the person who shot the home wasn't seen in any of them, as if they knew where the cameras were and how to avoid them, and they had only shot the home one time. 
Lori refused to give the security footage over to the police, saying she was going to use it in the lawsuit she was planning to file against the Myers, and claimed that she only wanted to contact the police so they had a record of what had happened. However, based on the details of these claims, many people believe Lori was the one behind both the bricks through the window and the paintball being shot at their home. Many people who have been close to the case state that it was clear that she was attempting to make herself the victim of the situation and paint the Myers as the bad guys, despite what she had done. However, the backlash had barely begun. It wouldn't be until nearly a year after Megan's death that the media picked up on what had happened. The Myers had been advised by the FBI to refrain from talking about the investigation as it was ongoing. But after reading an article on online harassment, Megan's aunt, Vicki Dunn, reached out to a reporter to cover the story. After the initial report, the story quickly gained steam, with CNN contacting the Myers to talk about what had happened and how no charges had come down in the case. When reached for comment, a police spokesman said Drew's behavior might have been rude and immature, but it was not a crime. The story grabbed headlines, with people appalled at what had occurred. And although Lori's name had been kept out of certain publications, online sleuths were able to find her within days. Lori's name, address, and phone number were publicized, along with calls to boycott the Drew's family business, despite what she had said about online harassment being not that bad when she did it to a 13-year-old, Lori felt as if, when it was directed at her family, it was too much. As the world was learning about the case, a blog popped up, criticizing how the case was being handled and how people were making it seem like Megan was an innocent victim. The blog was titled simply, Megan Had It Coming, and detailed what had occurred and why Megan deserved to be bullied. This blog only posted three times, in the first two posts claiming to be a person close to the case, and then a third post claiming to be Lori Drew. However, Lori denied responsibility publicly. Her lawyer likewise put out a statement, denying that Lori had anything to do with the cyberbullying, and instead tried to push all the responsibility on Ashley Grills, an 18-year-old girl who worked at her company. Ashley had no connection to the Myers family and had no reason to torment Megan herself. But after realizing that she had named in the police report, Lori attempted to use the girl to assuage her guilt. However, unlike Lori and Sarah, Ashley took Megan's death extremely hard. When she found out that the 13-year-old had committed suicide after talking to Josh, Ashley felt incredibly guilty. Lori allegedly told her to keep her mouth shut and to tell no one about what had happened, but she didn't know how to cope. She didn't know what to do and became suicidal herself. She sought treatment, and while the investigation was taking place, was in a psychiatric facility dealing with her own suicidal ideation. Because of that, she was never interviewed by the police, and Lori tried to shift blame from herself to Ashley. Diane, so many people have asked, where were the adults in this situation? Well, in an exclusive interview, the young woman who is at the center of all of this is speaking out for the first time and says there was an adult there. And worse, she was taking part. In the year and a half since Megan Meyer took her own life at age 13, her small, close-knit neighborhood still is struggling to heal. Just months ago, Megan's parents, Ron and Tina, could barely contain their pain. My life is nothing even remotely resembles what it was before. Lost the daughter, the family, just everything that was about us as a family as a whole no longer is. Never will be. Tina Meyer will never forget the anguish her impressionable daughter felt when a boy calling himself Josh Evans on the popular social networking site MySpace suddenly turned mean and insulting. Tina ordered Megan off the computer and her daughter stormed off to her room. I went upstairs and um, opened the door and saw her hanging in a closet and um, screamed and ran over and tried picking her up. Six weeks later, they learned there was no Josh Evans, that it was all a cruel hoax created in the home of neighbors Lori and Kurt Drew, whose 13-year-old daughter was unhappy with Megan. While authorities investigated, Lori Drew denied involvement, pointing the finger at this woman, 19-year-old Ashley Grills, as the mastermind of the fake account. But Grills, a longtime family friend of the Drews, insists that Lori was deeply involved in the deception. Who said, let's go online? Um, that was me and her daughter. And then she said, that sounds like a good idea. Lori Drew said that? Yes. So she was in 
from the beginning? Yes. No doubt in your mind? No doubt. And then you created the character? Yes. Ashley says she found a photo of a good-looking teenager and named him Josh Evans. Josh then contacted Megan. It was a prank, she says, to find out if Megan was gossiping about the Drew's daughter. What did you know about that friendship and whether there was any trouble between them? There was always trouble. They'd be friends one week and in an argument the next. The fake friendship went on for weeks with Josh flirting with Megan. And did everybody take turns writing at some point? Um, basically, yes. Lori, ever? A couple of times. So Lori actually sent messages as well? When we didn't know what to say. You're sure? I'm positive. Now, Lori Drew has said through her lawyer that she did not create or direct anyone to create the Josh Evans MySpace account, that it was really all your idea. True? Yeah, that's not true at all. Why would she say that? To cover her own self, I guess. So you go on and you're typing and you're going back and forth and it's fairly innocent. Then it starts to get nasty. Mm -hmm. Nasty messages. Yes. Then there's finally a really nasty message. Do you mm -hmm. remember it? Yes. What did it say? A world would be a better place without you. Who wrote that? I did. I was trying to get her angry so she would leave him alone and I could get rid of the whole MySpace. So you yeah. wanted to end it? Yeah. By now, Ashley says she was feeling guilty about the trick. So this message is sent out, and then something terrible happens in the Meyer household. Yes. What is going on there? My daughter just hung herself. It was October 16, 2006, when the Meyer's world was shattered. What did you think? What did you feel? I thought it was my fault. So what goes through your mind when you hear that a teenage girl that you all just played a joke on has committed suicide? A lot of things. Like it was my fault. <laughs> I shouldn't have said what I said. She says that Kurt Drew insisted that she quickly close down the MySpace account and that Lori instructed her to keep quiet. For a year, Megan's parents remained silent while Missouri officials investigated, but they soon went public with their story. A firestorm erupted with Ashley Grills right in the middle. Weeks ago, she testified before a grand jury in California, where MySpace is based. Criminal charges are being considered there. What kinds of things did you hear from people? They would tell me to kill myself and save everybody the trouble. People say they don't understand it. How could this have happened? Who could be so cruel? Who's to blame? I guess all of us. I mean, I'm partially to blame. They are partially to blame. What do you want people to know about you? That I'm not heartless. I do know what I did, and I take responsibility for it every day. But the Myers were not accepting that. It was clear, based off the initial police report, as well as Lori's actions, that her daughter had been the main people behind the account. But unfortunately, there were no laws in place that could get justice for Megan. Instead, Lori was indicted and convicted by a jury of violations of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act in 2008. This case was later vacated, as the courts didn't want to criminalize making a fake account and pass social ridicule. Lori has been able to walk free. But this trial allowed for the public to finally know why the Drews felt the need to harass and bully Megan. When being questioned on the stand, both Lori and Sarah admitted that they made the account for the express purpose of finding out what Megan thought about Sarah. They were suspicious that she was talking negatively about her, and Sarah went so far as to say that Megan was a bad friend and a bad person because she had called her a lesbian, fat, and weird. When asked by the defense if she had ever done the same to Megan, Sarah said she never did, then corrected herself, saying that she'd called Megan negative things sometimes, but she was a good person despite that, which is obviously ironic. After realizing Lori would never be brought to justice for her actions, and that technically nothing in this case broke the law, the Megan Meyer Cyberbully Prevention Act was passed. Tina then founded the Megan Meyer Foundation, a nonprofit that was made to educate about 
and end cyberbullying. A link will be left below to donate. If you have made it to this part of the video, thank you for watching. If there is a case you would like to see covered, let me know by leaving a comment down below or email me at dreading.official at gmail.com. Thank you so much for the 400,000 subscribers, and remember, stay safe.